Are we looking at a Trump or Biden win? And what does a win either way mean for Africa? These questions were at the heart of a webinar entitled 2020 U.S. Elections Relevance to African Policy, Economics and Dealmaking earlier today. Panelists, in, which included uh, Professor John Stremlow, the Honorary Professor of International Relations at the University of, the, of uh, Witz. Uh, let's chat to the professor right now. He's online for us. Thank you so much, Professor Stremlow, for joining us. Now, how would you describe describe U.S. foreign policy towards Africa under President Donald Trump's four-year tenure thus far? Thank you very much. It's hard to describe because at the presidential level, he has been totally negligent about uh, Africa, except for an uh, unfortunate aside that was picked up that was denigrating of all Africa. And then he's occasionally tweeted a, a, um, a condemnation of, of uh, the threats against white farmers as he as he perceives it mm. in uh, South Africa. So he's shown no interest, never been to the continent, never, never doesn't suggest he's going to come. But his programs continue because they have bipartisan congressional support so that the work in HIV AIDS, the work on on, on hunger and, and uh, energy and, and even the young leaders conference that uh, series that uh, Obama started, they, they're continuing and they have passed a big, uh, the Congress has passed and he has approved a big build act that is going to give um, financial underwriting to investors in, in from the United States and Africa. Mm -hmm. well, that's all good news. But I think Biden would be very, very different. He would be much more receptive to partnering with Africa. Yeah, well, that was going to be my next question. What would a Biden uh, win mean for the African continent? Would there be more engagement, do you think? Well, I certainly think there would be. Biden has a personal interest in Africa. He was in South Africa in 2010. He's uh, been, been, he followed the anti-apartheid struggle carefully and was an outspoken critic of, uh, of the uh, veto of the Comprehensive Apartheid Act by Ronald Reagan back years ago. He has also uh, a vice president who has got ties to uh, Africa through her father and ties to India through her mother. And so Kamala Harris is a real asset. And his advisors, like Susan Rice, like Karen Bass, the representative, or Chris Coons, the um, senator from Delaware, who roomed with, um, was a roommate of, of Uhur Kenyatta in college, for heaven's sakes, there's lots of linkages here, and I think what his advisors are saying is they want a more respectful, a more uh, engaged uh, relationship with Africa. And I suspect even including moderating the competition with China for Africa's advantage, I think Biden would be open to that. Yeah. And he certainly would be multilateral, and he certainly would be for climate change action. So I think there'd be cooperation in a number of areas, but his overwhelming preoccupations will be domestic with the pandemic and with the economic crisis. I suppose this is a sort of either or question, but how do you see the future in terms of trade and investment between the United States and Africa? Well, this um, new new effort to um, create a, um, an investment fund that would uh, backstop it, 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 uh, it private investors, the um, the Development Cooperation Agency, which is new under Trump, talks about <clears throat> doubling the assets available to $60 billion, uh, sort of could be by 2025, a total of $75 billion in investment guarantees. That would be very positive for U.S. investors who are interested in uh, trying to have a footprint in, in, in Africa. I think they would have to do it in a way that would satisfy the new uh, Corporate Transparency Act that is also likely to be passed so that there'd be less secrecy and less uh, illicit financial flows under a Biden administration than with the Trump administration. But overall, I think that's beneficial to uh, South Africa and to other nations that are trying to collect taxes on financial flows, but also encourage investment. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, you know, the African continent, like everywhere else in the world, has been badly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, more so, even though we haven't had the kind of level of casualties that we've seen in the United States and in Europe, for example. And of course, we will need investment on the continent. If we assume that the politics are right on both sides, that is in terms of the United States and here on the continent in terms of, um, you know, making it easier for people to come and invest on the continent. Do you think U.S. business people, investors, would be keen to come and invest on the continent? Well, it's it's difficult to, to imagine quite the scenario I'm playing, but 
take the pandemic first. The, the egregious handling of the pandemic by Donald Trump meant that the CDC, the, the, the Center for Diseases and Control and Prevention, was not the resource for African physicians and public health officials that it had been in the past for Ebola or for Zika or for Lassa fever. And I think that's going to change rather quickly. And I think what African leaders would, would need to do is to engage the Biden administration on an agenda which would be consistent with the economic recovery strategy that he will be producing that will have a very important climate change dimension to it, but also the economic recovery plan to look for ways in which they could relate to America's needs and America look, could look to relating to Africa's needs. I know that sounds very ambitious, and it is, but I think that's the only way forward given the preoccupations of governments here and government in the United States under Biden with, um, with, the, with the dealing of, of the economic crisis and the um, uh, public health crisis, as well as in the case of the U.S., to the racial crisis that has occurred as part of this uh, terrible pandemic. Yeah. Professor, before I let you go, of course, we do have the African Free Trade uh, Continental uh, Agreement uh, that's going to be taking effect come the beginning of next year. It was supposed to start in July, but because of the virus, it couldn't get going. How much of a game changer do you think that will be for the African continent? We know, of course, you do need good infrastructure right across the continent in order for, for goods to fr uh, flow freely. Let me say a couple of things quickly. One, I think it's important for China and the United States to at least have tacit cooperation, if not uh, a win-win-win with Africa at, at the center of it. I, I worked a lot on this when I was at the Carter Center. I think it, even, even with the hostilities that are arising, you could keep Africa as a confidence-building theater for China-American cooperation, and that would be very important for the BUILD Act and the uh, Belt and Road initiatives to work in hand-in-hand. I thought Millard Arnold um, in the Bowman's interview had a very good suggestion in the Biden administration should appoint a high level representative to the um, free trade agreement process here. Don't forget with these small economies and so divided as Africa is into 50 states it, or 47 in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's important to try to um, work collectively and that's a slow process, but Africa is committed to this. And I think the U.S. should be very encouraging of it and should get in on the ground floor and be helpful when it can be and be helpful when it can be in partnership with China. Professor John Stremlau, thank you so much for your time, sir. He's uh, an honorary professor at the University of Fitzwater's Rand.